Dzień dobry, good evening. This uh, meeting is in English, so I will speak English uh, today. Uh, my name is Ivana Korga and I'm president of the Piłsudski Institute and I welcome you all uh, in our house and I would like to introduce uh, our um, uh, distinguished guest. Jack Ferweather is with us. Hello, Jack. Nice to have you here. <laughs> So I hope each of you has a ticket because we will have a drawing of four books by the end of our event. So please uh, listen carefully because we may ask some questions. Um, I'm glad we have so many people, so many young people. We have two schools. Uh, we have representative of Polish Saturday School uh, from uh, Cyril and Methodius uh, Church here in Greenpoint. They are with the red shirts. Part of them are my class and uh, Mogosia is here, Mogosia Skrotsky. Uh, this is her class too. And we have also second class, second school. is a consular school connected with Polish consul, uh, Consulate General, right? And can you introduce yourself? This is a teacher. We welcome all students from this school also. And we have uh, Giovanni D'Amato. He is from um, uh, Williamsburg High School for Architecture and Design. This is a school that the Piłsudski Institute is uh, working and collaborating in many different projects. So I'm so uh, proud that you are here today. Thank you for coming. We have also board of directors, uh, and we have guests from Poland. Dr. Uh, Jadwiga uh, Rodowicz-Czachowska is with us. She came from Piłsudski Institute in uh, Sulejówek. So um, I will introduce our guest, and uh, Jack will speak to you uh, about the book and about uh, Pilecki. And we take it from there. So, Jack Farweather is a best-selling author of The Volunteer, the Costa Prize winning account of a Polish underground officer who volunteered to report on uh, Nazi German crimes in Auschwitz. The book has been translated into 26 languages, I listened yesterday, and uh, forms the basis of a major exhibition in Berlin. Uh, Jack uh, has served as a Daily Telegraph's Baghdad's bureau chief and as a video journalist for the Washington Post in Afghanistan. He, uh, uh, his uh, war coverage has won a British Press Award and Overseas Press Club Award citation. And yesterday he was awarded with our small uh, award. Uh, it's a medal uh, uh, with the name of uh, uh, Joseph Josef uh, Korzeniowski, um, uh, uh, Konrad Korzeniowski, a very important Polish writer who uh, was writing in English. And uh, we are very happy that you accepted the award. So I want to welcome you again and I give you the floor. Thank, thank you very much. I, I'm so honored to be here, especially in, in this place, which has been such a center of Polish community in New York for all these years, um, delving into the stories of so many Polish war heroes. Um, you know, many found their way to the United States. Many of their records are kept are kept here. Um, so this is just a, an amazing place to be able to speak and tell you a bit about my journey in following Vito Pileski's footsteps. I imagine that most of you have heard about Vitor Pilecki, is that correct? Is any? Yes, all right, good. So some of this will be a little bit repetitive, but I, I wanted to sort of share with you some of the scenes that meant a great deal to me in, um, in Pilecki's story, and, and also give you an idea of what the process of writing a book about this amazing man was like for me. Um, and so I always like to start with talks that I give on Pilecki just by taking a moment for us all to imagine what it was like to be in this apartment um, building on the third floor in uh, Jodibors district of Warsaw just before dawn and this is where Pilecki sat in, in, in this building. This is a war, actually a wartime image and Pilecki at this stage was 38 years old. Here he is in his favorite plaid suit. He was a Polish cavalry officer, as you know, 
a gentleman farmer, a devout Catholic, the father of two, and one of my favourite pictures of uh, his kids in fancy dress, because he, uh, his wife Maria, you'll see next, was a teacher in the local school in uh, Krupa, where they lived in, in the far east of Poland, and Polesky as a sort of farmer, he got to, he would pick up the kids from school and dress them up for little plays when his wife uh, Maria was to come home, and I quite like that idea of Polesky taking care of the kids, and um, whilst his, his wife was the, one, was the one with the stable income as the breadwinner, here is the amazing Maria um, Poleska um, on the day of their wedding in Ostrov Mesovieska, and this is one of my favourite pictures of the two of them together. There aren't so many, but here you see Poleski chest thrust out in pride as uh, Maria greets her new husband. Um, so I probably don't need to tell you all this, but this is something I have to, almost every non-Polish or non-Polish background audience I speak to, to tell them about how World War I began with the German invasion of World War II. Uh, World War II began with a single Pasutski around yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, How World War II began. Um, with these, I mean, these very shocking images, some of you will be familiar with, of course, which is October 1939, Adolf Hitler in Warsaw watching a parade of, of German forces. Um, and what was to follow, and this is why I have to sort of tell uh, non Polish audiences, uh, was a reign of you know, extraordinary, unparalleled terror. And this is before the Holocaust, before you know, many of the greatest crimes of the Nazis. But in those first few months of German occupation of Poland, 50,000 Polish nationals were um, murdered and in roundups, a little bit like this one. Um, the Germans were targeting the intelligentsia, um, anyone they thought who could resist, the Nazis, doctors, writers, uh, Jews and Catholics alike, dragged away and shot. And this is the context for Polesky's mission on that morning in 1940, because the underground had learned about um, the creation of a concentration camp, the first in Poland, for Polish nationals. This is also new to many audiences, this idea that Auschwitz was a place of initially Polish suffering. Um, and of course, here are, here are those, those infamous, infamous gates. And this was where Polesky was brought, um, you know, he sat in that apartment room. Um, as those gunshots rang out, as a German roundup began, because he knew, he'd been tipped off by the underground, that anyone in Jolly Borsch that morning, every military-aged man was going to be rounded up and potentially sent to Auschwitz. And his mission, his extraordinary mission, which still gives me goosebumps to think of, was to allow himself to get captured by German forces, to be sent to Auschwitz, to report on German crimes in the camp. And of of course, he didn't know what to, was to come. No one knew at this stage in 1940. But of course, he, like every Pole, had experienced those first months of brutal occupation. So he would have known his life was in extraordinary danger, as well as everyone else connected to, to him. I mean, he was putting himself in the hands of the SS. And that's what brought him here to this apartment and then three days later to Auschwitz and Polesky went on in his two and a half years in the camp to become the first to alert the world to its horrors through his smuggled reports. He became the first person to try and stop them by calling on the Allies to bomb the camp Three years before the Allies publicly acknowledged Auschwitz's role, he was, through secret messages, smuggled across occupied Poland all the way to London, telling the Allies exactly what was happening in this camp. And extraordinarily, when I came to this story myself in 2011, um, you know, his exploits were not at all known um, outside, of, outside of Poland. Um, 
And I only heard about his story by chance. I met up with a, a war reporter friend of mine. Um, we covered the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan together. And he had been to Auschwitz and seen an exhibition mentioning a Polish resistance cell in, in Auschwitz, which for me, as a non-Pole, coming to the story was very surprising, shocking even, because I, like I think most of us who have had an American or a British uh, sort of education think of Auschwitz as the death camp of the extermination of Jews, which it was to become, but not this place that was to become a testing ground of the worst form of Nazi experimentation that was to bring them to the final solution, show them how to kill on a mass scale. And Palecki, through his mission, was placing himself at the start of this terrible journey, the darkest journey in human history that Palecki was about to embark upon. So here is Palecki um, as that prisoner. Um, so I wanted to set about finding out about his his story, and I think um, there's a sort of parallel, a sister organization in some ways to the to the Pilsudski Institute, which is the Polish Underground Study Trust in London, which yeah. played another extraordinary role in, in London, just helping bring together Polish documents, during, preserving them after the war, during the communist takeover of Poland, and being another great resource. So this is, um, this is actually the the first place I went to as I began my research, um, because this very nondescript house is where Palecki's major work that he wrote at the end of at the end of the war, describing his mission to Auschwitz. This is where it's contained, and um, this is it. Um, and this also gives me a bit of goosebumps because this is a page of his report, and this is Palecki's handwriting. This isn't. This is the original. So this is. Um, you know, you're sort of getting a sense of how he wrote this. You can see he's like writing editorial corrections of all of us who've done essays or, or written anything. We know the sort of editorial process. And here's Palecki sort of working through what the camp meant to him. And um, this also is rather amazing to me. That beige folder on the third shelf, that is Palecki's reports. It's not kept at the sort of in Warsaw and the National Museum, it's you know it's just in this folder in a sort of wartime uh, filing cabinet that anyone can access. So I was very you know very touched to feel you know that you know and I think that's one of the joys of being a historian or researcher is to actually hold that material, which again is why the Pilsudski Institute is so incredible because you have that opportunity. You can go in there and touch these reports which were held by these extraordinary men, men and women. Um, I read this, this report, it was finally translated into English in 2012 and um, as a non, as non as a non-Polish speaker that was necessary for me and as a wonderful translator, Jaroginski, who, who did, the, did the work and that allowed me to discover the beginnings of Palecki's story, because what he wrote in this report was only a sort of partial account of his time. Of course, it was his truth as he felt he could tell it, but there were many gaps which I felt that I wanted to answer. Um, what had happened to all of these reports that he smuggled out of the camp? And that was a question that Palecki himself was never able to find out. In fact, in some ways, he felt that his reports had been a failure because the Allies had never taken action against Auschwitz. And so I set myself in part this double challenge of both trying to sort of tell Palecki's story using as much material as I could to recreate his story, but also to try and answer that question, you know, did the Allies find out what happened? Did they read his reports? Why didn't they respond? And I think on a deeper level, I also had a personal question, which is that there is something about that act of volunteering that really profoundly touched me, um, because I, at the time, was also 38 and had two kids, 
And I couldn't kind of conceive of myself going on such a mission and just thinking through what was it that made Paletsky risk his life on such a mission? Um, you know, what would drive someone into so much danger? So in January 2016, I set off to um, meet the family, which um, Sophia and Andrew are both alive. And this is a, another little image of them in a fancy dress and very nervous about meeting Andre because, um, yes, I was coming somewhat new to his father's story. I couldn't didn't know the language and, um, yeah, and, you know, here was I saying, can I write your father's biography? And I was expecting he might be a little bit skeptical. Um, but I shouldn't have worried because Andre is just the most delightful, charming of chaps and here he is. This was, I mean, we spent many, many hours over many, many um, weeks at his table. This is about his apartment in Warsaw, just talking about his father because when I told Andre I'd like to write your dad's biography, he said, well, I don't know, you know, I don't know where you're going to look. There's not much. And I said, Andre, I'm starting with you because everything you can tell me about your dad, every little memory is a way to sort of understand his thinking, understand what sort of man he was, understand, you know, answer that question, what would make someone volunteer for a mission to Auschwitz? And next place I went to after Andre was to that apartment where that mission began. And this was it in 2016. And again, I think in some ways touching historical records can give you this incredible energy and inspiration as a historian going to these places where the people you're writing about did some of their greatest exploits is also really inspiring. And so yes, that's where he volunteered for his mission to Auschwitz. And of course, I wanted to go um, inside, so <laughs> rang some buzzers, got into the stairwell and head up to the third floor. Um, the apartment where he began his mission was number seven, so we anyway, got, got upstairs to number seven and um, knocked on the door and there was no one, no one home. So I was there with my brilliant researcher, Mata Golian, who of course was integral for me doing all of my research in Poland, and she said, well, you know, as we're here, let's just, let's, cre let's create some of the audio of what it must have sounded like when the Germans came marching up the steps. So she sort of marched up the steps and then gave a sort of bang on the door, Gestapo style, and it <laughs> turned out that that's what was needed to <laughs> wake up the <laughs> students who <laughs> lived inside this <laughs> historic home. And they were like, told who, what? <laughs> The room where Polesky sat, um, as the Germans were sealing off the streets, the room where the caretaker knocked on the door and said, get out, you can still leave. Um, this is that room, <laughs> which was his, his dorm room. Um, so, yes. Um, by the end of the mission, to, he knew about Vitor Polesky. And, um, and I think the next thing I wanted to do after finding places like that was, and, and this happens in my career as a historian very rarely, where you can find a living witness of these events and bring them to the location themselves. And so um, this apartment belonged to uh, Butold's sister-in-law and um, his, um, sis his sister-in-law and nephew, her husband was had been a soldier and was in an internment in, in Germany at the time. And this was the little boy um, who was in the apartment when the Germans came calling at the at the door. And after meeting Andre Paleski, I, I tried to track down this little boy and managed to find him. His name is Marek Ostrovsky. Here he is uh, in his late seventies on the banks of Pliswa and. Um, I persuaded Mary to come back with me to that apartment and he, he hadn't actually been 
to that apartment since 1945 because the family were kicked out um, by the communist uh, regime that took took over Warsaw and many families who had patriotic backgrounds like Marek's were uh, discriminated against and um, so I took him back to that apartment and um, here he is confirming that that was the, actually the original door that we all banged on and here he is with Marta, my researcher, explained the layout of the furniture in the room, which I could describe. And here he is in this amazing bit of video describing that moment when Pilecki volunteered. The was, one was uh, in an army suit, mm -hmm. German, and another civil. Yes. And they ask, Mother, if there are any men, mm -hmm. there is any man here. Mm -hmm. In this same moment, uncle moved from, mm -hmm. from this room, asked, what, what's going on? What's going on? And he was ready to go? He had his jacket on? Or? I think he was prepared because mm -hmm. he has time to... to yes. No. Yeah. But did, what did he say to you when he was leaving? Did he say anything? Do you remember? He See you soon. You. See you. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I hope you can pick up Marek's emotion as he's sort of re remembering that scene, which is, um, then, you know, I think he ended up in tears at the end of that visit as he began to share other memories. Um, he, he knew if this was the apartment where Pileski returned to. Um, after his escape from Auschwitz and where he had his family reunion that was a very central place in the, um, in the story. Um, so the other part of writing a book like this is archival research. And so the place I've probably spent the most time during the research phase was here in, um, here in Auschwitz, uh, which has been a, an extraordinary um, memorial and museum uh, since the late 40s. Its mission has been to collect testimony of prisoners, um, and they got to interview many of the people who fought alongside Pileski or belonged to his resistance. And um, many of their accounts are in, in Polish and haven't been translated or used. Uh, to tell Pileski's story before. So I had the opportunity to discover dozens of accounts describing what it was like to meet Pileski in the camp, what it was like to be recruited by him, what it was like to take on the Germans inside Auschwitz. Um, I, don't, I don't know how many of you have gone to Auschwitz, but I, I very much recommend it. This is a visual flavor of one of the upper blocks not too dissimilar to the one that Pileski would have stayed in upon his arrival in Auschwitz. But, um, this is the, these are the prisoner testimonies which have been collated into these, into these volumes, which are just, I mean, as a testament to human evil, I think as sort of unsurpassed in any documents that I have ever come across. I mean, there's thousands of testimonies by um, former prisoners, survivors. Um, some are just tiny little fragments, people so traumatized all they could say were a few lines. Others are these expansive, beautiful, terrifying descriptions of their time in the camp. All of them you feel very privileged and honored to read. This, for example, is a, is a camp diary kept by one of Pileski's very close friends in Auschwitz. He wrote this um, in the camp whilst he was sick in one of the hospital blocks, just as the final solution was beginning in Auschwitz. So he's describing the arrival of some of the first Jewish transports to Auschwitz. Um, so, and, Gary Brooks and Jim Gavron uh, was also one of the first escapers from the camp um, as a messenger for Pilecki and supplied this document. Why? Because he 
smuggled it out of, smuggled it out of Auschwitz. Um, so I think in, in the interests of time, I will stop talking and open up to some questions. But I would like to close up with a reflection on you know, what I've come to feel is one of the most important aspects of Kalecki's story. And I think it is in that act of volunteering that you saw in that apartment. Um, I, I think, unlike every other prisoner sent to Auschwitz, Kalecki was not there by coercion, he was there by choice. And I think that act of choosing is something really important for us to take away today because of course we're bombarded with all sorts of horrors at all times in our everyday lives and our social media feeds and it's very easy to tune, to tune out and to disengage and I think what Pileski is asking us to do, what he asked the allies to do is to pay attention um, to take action and in that, I think, is one of his great sort of moral messages for us today. The other is that faced by the Nazis' extreme racial program designed to separate people, atomize them, turn them into numbers, help them on the way to the crematoria, Paletsky fought against that. He insisted on recognizing the suffering of prisoners in Auschwitz, whether they were his fellow Poles or whether they were Russian POWs, Russians who had invaded Poland uh, with Hitler and um, began World War II, or whether they were Jewish families from across Europe. His reporting is an extraordinary testament to the ability of a man a person to expand their moral horizons, expand who they care for, exactly the opposite of what the Nazis were trying to do, which was to crush that sense of altruism, that sense of nobility. And Polesky kept that in the camp. And I, that, for me, is a really extraordinary testament to his courage, his faith, um, his, his morality, and also why for me, his story is so integral to the telling of the, the story of Auschwitz because he is someone that we can follow into the camp. And whilst I left the story sort of <laughs> perched for you, um, it unfolds in the book and in Kleski's report um, that journey into, into the horror, into seeing how the Nazis devised the final solution, came to create an industrial killing machine that has never been repeated, but which you'll recognize the steps. They're not, you know, this wasn't just some plan plucked out of um, the evil ether. This was something that the Nazis experimented with and discovered step by step. And those steps, the smallness of them, the incrementalness is what's very terrifying, because you can see the steps around us today in different conflicts, which point towards um, you know, treating people uh, in the way that Nazis did, point towards genocide, which, um, you know, which Pileski is asking us through his reports that survived to, um, to preserve. So um, I would love to hear questions from you. I know I've got like a brilliant room of students who have been engaging with Polish history, um, perhaps like I have done, I'm sure you know a lot more than, than me. I would love to hear your questions, how you came to Pilecki's story, how he inspired you. Um, yeah, so tell me, tell me about how you, how you find Pilecki's story. What does, how does he resonate with you today? Any, any, brave, any brave takers? Please don't be shy. Ask the any, question. Any questions? Maybe I'll start. OK. <laughs> uh, two questions. Uh, one, how uh, did he manage to escape? A few words about that. Sure. <clears throat> and, and the second question, I didn't read your book, obviously, yet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I don't know.
know if, if it's a, in your book or not, something about Joseph Tselankevich, um, Joseph Tselankevich. I don't know if that name uh, said, say, is saying something. Because, uh, <laughs> because uh, uh, of course. But, yeah, I'll come, okay, okay, okay. All right, so to, to answer that question, I, so we all know that Pletsky escaped, and I think for me, approaching his, his story as a researcher it was something that seemed almost as extraordinary as his volunteering for Auschwitz. How on earth do you get out of Auschwitz once you're in there? And happily, his report that he wrote preserves many of the, the details, but as a historian, as a, especially as a narrative nonfiction historian, I wanted to recreate as many details as possible. So I'll share just some of those um, with you. Um, <coughs> Now, so, okay, this is just to show you the depths to which historians can sink. Um, when Bolesky was thinking, how do I get out of Auschwitz, his one, one idea he had was, oh, we'll go through the camp sewers, because no one would think to go, you know, on their hands and knees through the shit of 10,000 prisoners. So he um, spent, for, for several months in early 1943, he um, tried to explore um, through this manhole in the middle of the camp, tried to find a way through the sewers. Um, so I, I surprised the staff of the Auschwitz Museum by saying, oh, can I go and see what these tunnels are like that Pleski spent two months exploring? So they said, okay, no one's ever asked that before. Um, fortunately for me, when I got down into the tunnels, into the sewer tunnels, they, you know, nonsense, uh, cleaned out <laughs> of sewage, but, and this is a uh, sort of narrow shot, and um, went down the, the, the passageways, and what, what Polesky discovered, what I, you know, got to see was that through these passageways, um, it ended um, in a great overlooking Commandant Hurst's kennels, um, tantalizingly close, outside the camp, near Freedom, near the Sovo River, but not uh, too dangerous to escape. So instead, Pilecki, um bribed some of the, uh, the camp functionaries and got himself placed in a uh, baking commando unit. They were prisoners who would bake around the clock um, bread for the prisoners for the, for the guards. And that was the baker was outside the camp, was under guard. But by being outside of the camp, that was obviously a, an amazing first step to to escape. And so, um, so, so the, the bakery itself got uh, was demolished. Um, but using his report and the report of two other fellow escapers, we were able to recreate approximately what the, the space looked like. And then. I wanted to uh, visit myself at the same time, at the same hour that Pletsky staged his own escape. And it's now, as you saw, it's actually next to McDonald's now on the outskirts of the Pasquin Gym. That's the, uh, the train tracks. And after about 10 kilometers, um, this was um, the route by which Pletsky escaped. Now, the solar feeds into the Vistula, into the Viswa. And um, we worked out the, approximately where you saw that. Misty River, that was where Pilecki crossed. Um, he got out of the bakery um, in the end. Um, he th thought he'd be very clever and made a skeleton key uh, using uh, one of the metalworking workshops and the camp and a piece of dough. And it didn't work. And in the end, they just forced the door as the guard was at the opposite end of the building and dashed for freedom. It's, it's an incredible, nail-biting story as Pilecki tells us. And then, of course, he still had over 60 miles of occupied Poland to get through in order to reach safety. Um, and there was a safe house outside um, Novi Vizhnich, where he, uh, a family of a prisoner connected him as a place that he could head for. And I just, I'll just show you this if I This is the um, Pleskis escape routes around, you see from the camp around the outskirts of Krakow into the, um, into the hills, and this is a, a wartime 
image of the, the house where he sheltered, and this is where he wrote one of his first post-camp accounts of what happened in Auschwitz. And um, so after my after my my own escape from Auschwitz and falling on the, the river, we um, meandered, we went through the various towns that Pletsky mentions in his report, and um, yeah, it was very, uh, in one town we stopped, and our research technique was to say, is anyone here very old who can, might remember the wartime mm -hmm. period, and in, in one village um, we found, um, yeah, two eight-year-olds who had been kids and whose parents had sheltered Pileski, because um, he, he would just show up in houses and say, please take us in. Um, and although this was, this was very dangerous to do, this was Poland, and people embraced him and looked after him until he got to the safe house. And oh, oh sadly, I don't have that video in this. Oh, here we do. Yes, good. So here he is, escaped from Auschwitz. It's about two months after his escape. You see how thin and emaciated he is. Oh, that's not how we are. Good. And this is the, the, the host, Taurus, uh, Thomas Kofinski, and his daughter Maria. This is when the house, which is again one of those moments where you get to touch history, which is so exciting. And this is Maria, that little girl who um, remembered Pilecki sitting at this very table where we were having our. Uh, <laughs> hard research. Yeah. And that was a little, oh, yeah. a little bit of his. Um, a little bit of his before and yeah I think I think as a as a writer as a biographer when you're trying to imagine the experience of the people the person you're writing about often it's you know it's very hard to do I mean Pletsky saw the worst things imaginable in Auschwitz um, sitting at that table though with being hosted by the same lovely woman who had played with Pletsky at the barn as he was recovering from Auschwitz. That, that gave me a, an experience, something perhaps an experience, which is wonderful Polish hospitality. Um, great. That, um, so, <laughs> very long answer. But anyway, I'm pleased to have showed you a bit more of the research. I, I could talk about research all night long because I'm very, very passionate about engaging with history in, in this, this way. Um, Josef Serengevich, but that's, uh, well, um, Persky's time in the camp, for, for those of you who don't know, Serengevich was the, went on to become prime minister in communist Poland and, and a, a controversial figure, I think, um, for prisoners, especially those who, like Persky, fought against first Nazi occupation, but then the communist takeover over of the country, and they felt certainly betrayed. There was a bond between prisoners in the camp that um, many felt had been broken by Zrinkiewicz's decision. Um, there were some stories about what did Zrinkiewicz um, somehow um, help Polanski get executed. There was an appeal by the family to spare Pilecki's life after he'd been captured by the communists. And um, I, I think there's no real evidence to suggest some deeper plot, but um, but obviously for many of the families, it was Jim um, which is a you know, difficult subject to talk yeah. about. Okay, thank you. So now we would like to ask uh, students, do you have a question? Adam, please. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to ask how exactly he managed to get messages out of the camp, because I assume it was fairly locked down at the time. And then also a question for you specifically, did you manage to answer those questions that you started with? Okay, excellent questions. Um, yes, in short. Um, and this was perhaps one of my favorite moments of the research, um, because it was in some ways the most... Um, Extraordinary. Um, Pilecki's first messenger from the camp, he, you know, he, he experienced the full force of what Auschwitz was 
abolish political prisoners, hard labour, starvation rations, prisoners being beaten to death all, all around him. And um, he knew that it would be incredibly hard. I mean, he couldn't stage an escape because prisoners, when there were escapes, there was mass punishments for the inmates. He did, however, hear that this chap, Alexander Wielopolski, his family, um, had arranged for his release, which was very unusual in the camp's history, and Paletsky um, approached him and had him memorize word for word his report, detailing exactly what was happening to the prisoners in Auschwitz. And Paletsky, in, in, in his report, um, uses a, a, code, code, a key um, to hide his identity because um, when Paletsky was writing at the very end of the war, you know, Poland's already on the cusp of being seized by the communists, and it was already clear that they were targeting members of the underground who had fought against the Nazis. So he had to hide his identity, and um, we just had it. So we just have his name. This brilliant scholar cracked the code, so we got the name. Um, so my uh, researcher tracked down um, Alexander's son, Piotr who was a chap I got to meet in Warsaw, Warsaw in 2017. And this will, I mean, some of, for you, for all of you with Polish backgrounds, you'll recognize this story. We told, when we told Piotr, oh, tell us about your dad's mission for Paletsky, he was like, I don't know anything. Dad didn't say anything. I mean, you know, which gives, gave me my first insight into just how terrible post-war Poland was for these, for, for this yeah. generation. But, you know, we're unable to grow up with these stories of heroism that we in the West, as Brits, as Americans, you know, we get to celebrate our D-Day heroes. I would like to ask you, since you did such an extensive research, I'm sure, did you ever find out that the reports, Pilatsky's reports, were delivered to the English government? And if yes, why they were ignored? This is, that's another fantastic question. And we then, taking, yes. this, taking this material, we dug around in the, in the British archives and found what happened to this ver these very words reach the desk yeah. of Charles Portal, who was the head of the uh, Bomber Command. And he and his deputy had a, an exchange saying, can we bomb Auschwitz? And, you know, it's incredibly effective. To, to read, I mean, effective as an emotional thinking about how much weight is lying behind those their decision. Because what they say is, um, yes, we can bomb Auschwitz, but it would all we could probably manage because it would be further than any bomber had gone there before. Most of the fuel, most of the payload capacity would have to be taken up with fuel, so it would be fuel tanks. It would just be a token bombing, so there's no no point. So let's it would just be a political gesture. And so they this is it to one side. But of, of course reading that now from our perspective, knowing what was to come, knowing that I mean I think what's one something that affects us all when we think about the Holocaust, all of those people getting onto trains and not knowing what Auschwitz was, not knowing where those trains were going, not knowing until the very end of the war that Auschwitz was a death factory. Paletsky was offering them the chance to put a bomb on top, even just one bomb on top of Oswentia, and make that a place, make that a symbol of the brutality of the Nazi occupation. And, you know, of course, the Nazis would probably have used other death camps and other facilities, but it actually would have created a precedent for the Allies taking action um, against Nazi atrocities. And in fact, this, this decision behind this, this first, very first report, this created a precedent then for every other report of his, but also from other underground sources in Poland or across Europe. The Allies just kept harking back, saying, no, let's, we're not going to bomb it. When, in 1944, there was a, a, another famous escape from Auschwitz by two Jewish prisoners who's, um, who laid out and 
deep, you know, great detail what yeah, the death factory, the Auschwitz had become. And this decision, this report made it all the way to Churchill. When he was considering what to do in response to that report, they dug up this, this very, these very words of Valetsky, they dug up in their response to them. And they were like, oh, this would just be political if we were to do it. And so that meant they decided not to bomb Actually, it's in 1944, even when it was at that, you know, at the height of the, um, the extermination of um, Hungarian Jews at the it's very zenith of mass murder on the deer, rather. So um, it's it's a really agonizing moment. I, I tell the story of what happens to Blesky's other reports in, in the book, because he was chronicling as the camp was getting worse and worse. He was Telling, oh, now they're euthanizing prisoners. Um, now there's the first experiments with gas against Soviet POWs. And these reports were all getting to London, and something like that initial response was what was what was coming. It's, it's political. We can't, we can't do anything. It would be a distraction from our from the war effort. And I think you know we can perhaps understand that to some extent, in, especially in 1940 when it was the British standing alone against the Nazi juggernaut. But of course, you know, what becomes clear as these sentiments get repeated again and again is that there is a deeper message, which is that they didn't care what was happening in Auschwitz and they didn't care what was happening to it in Poland and, uh, and that was, but during the war, of course, after the war, um, they, they turn, their, turn their back, which is, of course, exactly what Kletsky asks us not to do and why his story is so important, because although the Allies didn't listen then, maybe we can listen to them now. Yeah. I just also wanted to add on that by 1944, if I'm not mistaken, the United States Bomber Command was able to raise targets practically all over Europe, even like far down in Italy. So. They could have, but as you said, they just didn't feel like it because they didn't feel like it would do anything. It, it, it's a, I mean, it's a really, it, it's a whole sort of subgenre of Holocaust history. Is could the Allies have bombed Auschwitz? And I think for me, a lot coming to it sort of later on with the knowledge of Pilecki and his first report. A lot of it seemed a bit um, sort of technical, like. How much, you know, could they actually have destroyed the gas chambers or, or not? Or how quickly could the Nazis have rebuilt the railways had they blown up the, the um, interchanges? But for me, it, that's besides the point. The point was to bomb Auschwitz, to tell the world what Auschwitz was, to stop the Nazis in their tracks. Had to have at any point in from 1940 to 1944, I think the history of Auschwitz would have would have been different, and I, I feel very strongly that that's what Pilecki himself felt. And he left, he escaped from Auschwitz precisely because he had grown so desperate at the lack of action that he thought, I'm going to risk my life escaping to try and tell people because my reports aren't, aren't working. We have one, one second. I have a, I want to ask a younger student here. Do you have any questions? Or maybe the teacher want to ask a question for your students. And then we will give the floor to others. Now you still have to think about the story, yes? Okay. So um, who has the question then? Yes, please. And then John. Hi, uh, thank you for the exceptional presentation. My question is why you were doing the research if you were able to find out if that's the decision was his individual, private decision, or if he wanted to the order from his super, superiors. So that, that's, that's also a really great question, because the, um, the book is called The Volunteer, and I think in a lot of people's minds that you sort of think about him saying, oh, well, pick, pick me, and you know, and it, it wasn't the case. Um, when Pilecki, volunteered for Auschwitz, um, he, I, he wrestled with that decision. Um, there was an earlier roundup um, in Warsaw in July 1940, which 
that he had been sort of tipped to, to, to enter in order to go to Auschwitz, and he, and he missed it. And in fact, his commanding officer sort of slightly teased him about it, saying, oh, you missed a good opportunity there at um, Auschwitz, and sort of I can only imagine this dark wartime humor. Um, and so, you know, Pertsky, you know, he, he struggled with the decision. We don't know huge details of his thought, of his thought process. He wrote a, a, a small document called How I Found Myself in Auschwitz, which is um, still not translated into English, which gives his sort of, his biography as a, as a young man up to that point. Uh, what he says there is that he didn't want to go to Auschwitz um, because it would be leaving behind his cell. He was a member of the underground in Warsaw at the time, and he, he was a, the recruiter in chief, and he brought on these young men. And for him, Warsaw was the center of action. And the idea of getting sent to some concentration camp to see how the rest of the war um, on some level seemed like a at the least how he presented it in this report. I, I suspect a little bit maybe there's some sort of, you know, bravado of Pilecki's there, like I don't want to, you know, want to be where the, the main action is. Um, he saw his wife just before he volunteered for the, for the mission, and um, you know, one can only imagine how difficult it was knowing that he would be placing them in danger. He, he never told Maria about his about his mission, about his mission. Um, so, yes, this was not someone who was charging into to the gates of hell, as perhaps the image on the book suggests. Um, it was a man who was presented with a mission to find out about Auschwitz and wrestled with it and took it up. And I think it's important to recognize that the underground in the, in May 19 June 1940 was I mean very isolated. The, the Brits, I mean, most of Western Europe was falling to the Nazis at this time. The Brits were standing alone, but for how long they didn't know. And really, all the underground could do was just try and keep telling the world, "We're here. This is what's happening in Poland. Please pay." Pay attention, and that's why going going on this mission to concentration camp had a, had an important role to try and understand and share with the world um, some of the horrors of the German occupation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think everybody uh, here tonight knows that uh, he was murdered by the communists after the war. Given his heroism and non-political figure, what in your opinion was the reason that he wasn't somebody who directly challenged such possible domination, he did something he did kind of politically neutral, so what would be the reason to kill him? Well, I, in your opinion? Well, I think, um, <coughs> I mean, as much as we know about the thinking of the early communist regime, but they saw that those who could oppose the Nazis, who were capable of creating underground <coughs> networks that might weaken uh, state rule, uh, were a threat. And so um, they understood that the Polish underground was opposed to the communist takeover, so any member of it was, um, was a danger. And, um, of course, it was also helpful for the Poles. I mean, ex you know, before his execution was a show trial, which was designed as a tool of terror to force <coughs> the country to submit by saying, this is what we can do to anyone who opposes us. And you know, Plesky had the misfortune um, to be to be selected, but of course, as you know, many tens of thousands <coughs> were, were targeted in, in this way. So I, I don't think it was that Pleskin was particularly opposed to communism. I think many, many were and shared his, his views. Uh, what said, he was singled out because, of course, they knew about his role in the, in the camp. Um, he was a, 
great organizer. <coughs> it's one of the reasons why he was selected to volunteer, because as a recruiter for the underground, he was just remarkably good at setting up networks. So there's a certain sort of sense to targeting um, Polesky, but I mean, they were, of course, um, are there any is that is that your sense also? <laughs> so we have one more question, please. Through the course of research, uh, did you find any documents uh, pertaining to uh, Pilecki's state of mind after feeling like he was betrayed, especially like, you know, after escape, uh, that about the inaction of the Allied government, uh, particularly, you know, he volunteered to save Poland, you know, uh, that, that's like unwavering loyalty uh, to, to do what he did. And like, when I was reading the book, in my head, I don't think, at the, you know, at this time, I would not have any guts to do what he did. Uh, would it would it change their like the with the circumstances was different? I don't know. But uh, how did he feel? Did you find any like documents suggesting that you know sort of betrayal? He lost a lot of people, friends. Uh, you know, dodged death pretty much every single day, being in Auschwitz. You know, being a prisoner. Uh, how did he feel after getting out, knowing that whatever he did, his report was pretty much useless? Or you know. At that time, obviously, it's a for us. It's a very important document. But during that time, like when people find out and they did nothing, I think that's such a great question. It's, it's one that I very much wanted to kind of understand myself. And in some ways, my first sort of way to touch that question was learning from Andre that after the war, when he was reunited with his family, that he told never shared any details with his wife about what had happened in Auschwitz and you know that for me you know begins to speak to some of this this deep trauma that he that he experienced that with someone of, of course his wife that he just couldn't speak to it and of course that was quite a common experience among the prisoners that I got to, to speak to um, and the memoirs that the extreme difficulty of sharing with anyone who had been in Auschwitz that experience. Um, and, you know, Leslie writes in, in one of his report of his frustration of talking to Polish underground operatives and getting dismissed. You know, they say, oh, we just thought you were all a bag of bones in Auschwitz and, you know, went up too much. And, you know, his, his anger comes through. Um, which is, and, and his frustration at not being able to sort of capture that experience. And one of the very, I found a fragment of the memoir that he was planning to write at the very end of his life, of which that report was, you know, was gonna be a sort of building block. Um, but um, he, he was trying to write a prologue to it and capture his experience of what Auschwitz was. And he, he was writing this in 1940, early 1947, um, just before his capture, and you can really s just see him struggling to just say um, what was Auschwitz. He s talks about it as a sort of out-of-body experience. He sort of uses some very complicated metaphors of planets and webs and horror, and you can just, it, it, it's, it's almost impossible. My Polish researchers were reading it, we, we were like, we can hardly, make sense of what he's saying here. And you can feel that struggle. Um, and of course, it's one of the tragedies of his life being taken is that unlike writers like Primo Levi or Eli Wiesel, who had many, many years to then digest their experiences and write some of the books that, by which we know Auschwitz, Pilecki was left still, I mean, you know, in the midst of the war and you know, not able to have that that experience. However, at, he writes this garbled attempt to describe Auschwitz, and then he just sort of snaps out of it in this tiny little fragment that we found, and he says, I've sat with prisoners, many prisoners, my friends in Auschwitz on the night before their execution, which was very common for political prisoners that they would be executed. Every single one of them had the same regret. And that regret is that they did not reach out enough to the ones they loved in their own lives when they had the chance. 
and that is incredibly powerful for me because of course there's this big message from Boletsky which is like pay heed to genocide and war crimes and, um, and the world around us but at the very you know, the last message almost of him as a free man it's just a very personal one in some ways that's what it relates to himself like him wishing that he or maybe even thinking that he could himself begin to reach out with his kids and his wife to whom he was you know, not living with, he was doing his underground work, of course, but he also wasn't engaging with them emotionally because he couldn't because of these struggles. And then, of course, a few months later, he was arrested and, and then began his you know, terrible torment at the hands of communist um, torturers. Yeah. Thank you. I think um, if you all agree, we can move to the second phase. Uh, of this meeting and uh, probably a lot of people has books that would like to ask you to sign it. Yes,